Hello, my chicken saints. Welcome back. Last week we studied 1 Nephi 1 through 5. I hope you enjoyed our, our head first dive into the text itself. And I hope that you put up with me for an extra hour. Uh, for those of you who are longtime listeners, we basically did half time. And for those that were looking forward to a one hour video, we did double time. So we're, well, I'll keep working on it. Okay, bear with me. Uh, but today is a about as perfect a sequel of last week's lesson as you can imagine. Because the way chapter 5 ended last week, the boys have come back with the plates. Mom's thrilled. Dad wants the scriptures. And so it's like, son, give them to me. And he begins to search them from the beginning, finding that they are of great worth unto them. And realizing that for his sake and ours, it is wisdom in God that we should carry these books with us in our journey through the wilderness toward the promised land. Now, as far as the narrative of the story is concerned, the next m moment in the storyline comes in chapter 7. We go from 5 to 7 because it's actually really interesting the way it works out because if he's studying these scriptures from the very beginning and he's told us that they begin with the books of Moses, including an account of the creation and of Adam and Eve, I picture Nephi, or excuse me, Lehi there in the wilderness reading this and going, oh, and it is not good for man to be alone. Oh, no. And he just realized that I've brought four uh, Adams with me and they don't have any Eves with them. So something's got to change. And right there at the beginning of chapter 7, he sends his boys back to Jerusalem. There's no complaints this time around uh, to go find Ishmael and his family that has more Eves than Adams to match up with, with Lehi and Sariah who had more Adams than Eves. Okay? Seriously, match made in heaven. We'll see more of that when we get to chapter 7. But that's the question. Why not jump straight to chapter 7? Again, as far as the storyline is concerned, chapter 6 is an interruption of the narrative. It gets in the way. And ironically, if you were to remove chapter 6 from 1 Nephi, the storyline would flow better, not worse. That's usually not the case when you skip a chapter. Now, the best example of this I can see in the Old Testament is Genesis chapter 38, which in some ways has nothing to do with chapter 37 before it or 39 after it. It interrupts the narrative. And if you were to pull out Genesis 38, completely skip it, you wouldn't miss a beat in the storyline of Joseph being sold into Egypt. However, it's included there because it serves a fascinating purpose that intensifies and helps us appreciate better all that comes after it. And in a way, chapter 6 of 1 Nephi is doing the same kind of oh, narrative heavy lifting, okay? Interrupting so that we, it, it makes the, what comes after more meaningful to us. Got it? So let's read it. We're going to see all six verses. We're going to go verse by verse on this one because it's really important. Uh, what Nephi is going to do in chapter 6 is talk about the gold plates, his project, okay? Uh, this, this major gift that he's giving us by way of his ministry. And in some ways, that's perfect based on the way chapter 5 ends. Again, storyline, go from 5 to 7. But it's as if Nephi is, is recording this, writes down that we brought home the brass plates. Dad began to search them from the start. This was a new book for him. And as right as he began reading them, he realized this, this book is worth its weight in brass. Uh, it's incredible. We need this book. And it makes me wonder if right in that moment, Nephi realizes, well, my readers are having a similar experience. They've just obtained a record. It's new to them. Will they realize that this book is worth its weight in gold? Will they understand my purpose in writing it, and realize that, yes, it's wisdom in God that they carry this book with them in their wilderness wanderings toward the Promised Land. That's why he stops, stares out of the, uh, into the camera. He breaks the fourth wall to be able to address his Latter-day readers. This is what this book is going to be all about. So keep this in mind with everything moving forward. First Nephi chapter 6, verse 1, And now I, Nephi, do not give the genealogy of my fathers in this part of my record. Neither at any time shall I give it after upon these plates which I am writing. For it is given in the record which has been kept by my father, wherefore I do not write it in this work. Eh, for it sufficeth me to say that we are descendants of Joseph. Now, you uh, incredible family historians out there realize that this is some lousy genealogy. He skipped all kinds of generations to say, yeah, Joseph's back there somewhere. We come from his tribe. Okay, we're, we're good. Now, it's actually interesting because he's going to start this chapter, which tells us what the Book of Mormon's about, by admitting what it's not about. And I say admit for good reason. In some ways, he's apologizing for the way he's starting his book for the fact that he's not starting with his family history. 
I actually met someone who was attacking the Book of Mormon. Now, I have those kinds of conversations with people that, uh, that don't believe in, in the gospel. And this, this skeptic pointed out, if the Book of Mormon were really an ancient Semitic text, if it were what it claims to be, and it were some kind of ancient Hebrew record, then it would begin with genealogy. And I remember joking at, at first with this, conver this conversation partner saying, wait, is, that's what you want? Is that, is that what you look forward to when you study the Old Testament? He begat him, and he begat him, and begat him, and begat him, and all the way down. Those are usually the chapters I kind of skip over. Uh, and I laughed, and he didn't. Uh, but he said, no, it's so important for a Hebrew writer to establish his credibility by way of lineage. Go reread the book of Ezra, for example. And if you can't trace your genealogical line back to the tribe of Levi, no priesthood for you. At least that's the way it, it's described there. Now, what's interesting, as he'd made this point and said, if the Book of Mormon were a true ancient Semitic text, it would start with, with genealogy. I've actually put, uh, asked this question of my students, and some of them have said, well, 116 pages. Uh, it could have been on that, and maybe the Book of Mormon actually did begin with genealogy. I said, ooh, that's good. It, it's speculative, but, but it's good speculation. And actually, we see in this first verse that there's probably some truth to that. It is given in the record which has been kept by my father. So he must have included a, a clearer genealogy than Nephi did. Uh, to this conversation partner of mine, I said, well, go to the book of Ether. You're the end of the Book of Mormon. And in the, at the very beginning of the Jaredite record, what do you have? A page worth of genealogy. And he begat him and he begat him and so forth. Uh, it, it's actually interesting to me, and I pointed this out to him, your complaint in terms of an argument against the Book of Mormon actually becomes an argument for the Book of Mormon. Because if it's an ancient Hebrew text and it's supposed to begin with genealogy, and Lehi says it, or Nephi says it did in Lehi's part, but when he's beginning his own book, he apologizes for it. To me, that's fascinating that it's as if he knows the convention. He knows the way this book is supposed to begin, but feeling content that dad had done that job for him and he wasn't going to start his with a reiteration since it's one generation later, he just cuts to the chase and skips over the genealogical portion. But again, the fact he's nervous about that and has to explain himself and apologize for this apparent omission would suggest what's going on in his mind. Okay, fascinating. I also want you to keep this in mind when we get to the smallest portion of the small plates, when we get to Jerem and Omni especially, uh, as they're passing down the plates very in a speedy succession, what part does genealogy play then? And how does that compare to the part that it doesn't play for Nephi? Okay, so first admission, this is not going to be a book focused on genealogy. Uh, verse 3, here's the second admission. It mattereth not to me that I am particular to give a full account of all the things of my father, for they cannot be written upon these plates. Now, some have said, oh, well, this, the Book of Mormon, isn't that a history of the ancient inhabitants of the Americas as far as religi their religious views are concerned? Well, yes and no. If it's history, it, well, what kind of history is it? Because as a historian myself, if I would have turned in any paper during my graduate years to my history professors that said something along those lines, yeah, I'm not going to be really particular in this history. I'm not going to give a full account of, the things that, of all the things that happened, because it really mattereth not. But that would raise the eyebrows of my history professors. They'd say, uh, what do you think history is? It's, we've got to be particular. We're trying to give as full an account as we can because, yes, it mattereth. So, F for you, <laughs> okay? Well, again, from Nephi's perspective, is that his goal? I'm not trying to establish genealogy, nor am I emphasizing history. I'm going to include just enough of it that there's a skeleton upon which I can attach some flesh. But the flesh of this story is of much more important stuff. It is an incarnation of Christ that we're seeing on the page. So don't worry about what's happening in terms of every historical detail of Nephites versus Lamanites and so forth. Mormon himself will say, I can't even include the 100th part. And so as far as history is concerned, there are whole uh, centuries passed over in a verse or two. 
And then it's like he pulls the emergency brake during the, the rain or during the ministry of Alma and really pours over a lot of detail. Again, it's not, it's not good history, but it's incredible theology. And that's the point Nephi is trying to make. Look at the end of 3 and verse 4, and it will tell you his stated purpose for these plates. I'm not going to do genealogy. I'm not going to do history, for I desire the room that I may write of the things of God. That's what this book is. The study of God is theo, that's theos is God, ology, study of. And so the things of God, the study of God, this is going to be theological first and foremost. And here's why. For the fullness of mine intent. Now that's about as strong a thesis statement kind of language as you can get. What's the purpose of my paper? You can, you've all written history papers or English papers where you have to start with some kind of thesis statement near the beginning. Establishing the purpose of your paper. This is the argument I'm trying to prove. Well, think of the language here. The fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. That, in one sentence, is the book's central purpose. Let me give you a chart <laughs> that might help in terms of what the Book of Mormon is as compared to what the Book of Mormon isn't. By its own self-identification, okay, this book is not meant to be primarily descriptive. That would have been history. No, this is meant to be primarily persuasive. It's trying to persuade you to do something to act on its central invitation, which is to come unto Christ. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you'll come to him, he will save you. That's the entire point of this book of Scripture. Not its history, not its genealogy. It's persuasive power to convince you that Christ is an approachable being that God is a loving, welcoming Father. Arms outstretched, come and see. Just as Jesus said, beginning his ministry. The Book of Mormon begins its ministry with the same invitation. Come and see. Come and see Jesus for who he really is. So again, it's persuasive, not descriptive. Let me put that in different terms. It doesn't intend to be expository as much as it intends to be rhetorical. And what I mean by rhetorical is Aristotle's definition. He defined rhetoric as, the, as making use of all the available means of persuasion. And again, if this book is meant to persuade, then yes, it's a rhetorical effort. I am trying to convince you. Do you remember that line from the title page? To convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. This is a persuasive, rhetorical work. And it's meant to change our minds and change our hearts. And because of that, it is far more reader-oriented than writer-oriented. Yes, you can see the fingerprints of Nephi or Mormon all over the text, but it is meant to affect us. It's aiming at us. It breaks the fourth wall like no other book of Scripture I've ever seen. That's why you get Mormon so often interrupting his narrative to say, and thus we see. It's like he's looking out at his readers and trying to gauge our level of understanding. Are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? I hope so. That's why I'm trying to make it as, as clear as I can. Because if you see this, it will affect your behavior. You'll understand what you need to do based on what I've taught. And, and that's the rhetorical, persuasive power of this book of Scripture. As a result of that, it is less a window to the past, although it does help us see that. But it's more of a mirror for the present. That's why I was talking about Book of Mormon stories a couple of weeks ago. And it's yours that matter most. What will your experience in this text be? This book, yes, gives some information on the world behind the text, the cultures and civilization that produced it. There is better information on the world within the text and understanding the kinds of lives that were lived right there on the page. But its greatest contribution is in its effect on the world in front of the text. And that's the world you and I live in. What will it do to us? Because this book is not so much an object as it is an agent. As an agent, it, it doesn't care so much about being an object because it has an object. That is an objective. And the objective statement right there in verse 4 is to change us. 
It's to make Christians out of us. It's to convince us that we can come unto Christ and that we must, because only thereby can salvation come. As a result of that, look at verse 5, wherefore, so because of this stated intent, which is meant to affect every single authorial and editorial decision from this moment forward. So wherefore, the things which are pleasing unto the world, I do not write. Sorry, if that's what you're looking for, find a different book. There's lots of those amazing worldly page turners that will please people that are looking for that kind of action. But no, this isn't that. Forget about those pleasing unto the world. But the things which are pleasing unto God and unto those who are not of the world. And what I love about that statement is it shows that the Book of Mormon is a barometer to our spiritual sensitivities. It's a way to gauge my own spiritual taste buds. Because if I find no savor in this scripture, it tells me about my own interests, my own desires, my own spiritual sensitivities. If, yeah, if it's... If it feels boring, for example, am I so intoxicated by the action-packed thrillers where the, the, the mile-a-minute kind of explosions that we see in Hollywood blockbusters as opposed to the gentleness, the peace and power of the Holy Spirit? To think about what this book is trying to accomplish. It, it, uh, President Benson used to say that the Book of Mormon is not on trial. We are. And I get that sense right there in verse 5. That, because, actually put it this way, have there been times in your life where the Book of Mormon has meant everything to you? And other times when the book has not meant very much? At times, it's almost like sports. Some games you're in the zone and some you're not. And the game hasn't changed, you have. The book hasn't changed, we have. And so if I am ready to open this book and begin a serious study so that that power can immediately begin to flow into my life, that tells me something about my, myself, my own spiritual preparation. And if it's a ah, take it or leave it, I'm getting nothing out of this. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to condemn anyone. I'm just trying to put the thermometer under their tongue to get a sense of how they're doing right now. And if you meet someone who has no spiritual taste for the Book of Mormon, I wouldn't chide them. I wouldn't condemn them. I wouldn't pass some kind of final judgment. I would be much more curious to know about the experiences they've had just in life, uh, their perceptions and perspectives on God and God's interaction with his children, with that child right in front of me particularly, because it's their attitude toward this book of Scripture that will speak volumes about how they're doing. Keep that in mind. And then, notice verse 6. Wherefore, so again, because of this foundational authorial decision that we're going to only do the things that will bring people to Christ, because of that, wherefore, I shall give commandment unto my seed that they shall not occupy these plates with things which are not of worth unto the children of men. Remember, that's how chapter 5 ended. We found out that this, these brass plates were of great worth unto us. Well, that's what Nephi is basing his... That's the criteria he wants all of his posterity to use when they're deciding what to write down. So picture Mormon thinking, what 100th part do I include? Well, it better be the things of God. It better be the things that are of greatest worth. It better have persuasive power to convince people that they can come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so they can be saved. Salvation is the ultimate design of this book of Scripture. And if Nephi had his way, and he does by and large, everything written in it will point us and pull us to Jesus Christ. I love that. It actually helps put in perspective something he said even earlier. Because sometimes when you're writing a book or a, or a paper, if you wait too long to get to your thesis statement, sometimes people kind of get lost. Like, wait, why am I reading this? Should I keep turning pages? And chapter 6, six chapters into it might feel a little late. Well, for that then, go back to chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Nephi actually gives us his initial thesis statement. 
and he phrases it like any good thesis statement would be. And it comes right at the end of this, this first chapter, which is a great place to put a, a, a thesis. Listen to it. I skipped over it last week. But in the midst of all of this conversation about learning from the Lord that Lehi taught us last week, uh, as, as Nephi is recounting this and saying that dad went and preached all that he learned, he was persecuted as a result. But de despite all this persecution, notice how the chapter ends. But I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. That is another thesis statement for the Book of Mormon. Think about how he said it. I will show unto you, again, that's thesis language. The purpose of my paper is, the fullness of my intent is, what I'm going to prove. In fact, I remember writing my dissertation and my, my advisor kept saying, make sure every chapter moves the ball forward. Within a chapter, make sure that every, every uh, paragraph moves the point of that chapter forward. Uh, it felt like almost a football coach, like run north and south. Quit going side to side with all these. There, there's so much movement here that doesn't get us closer to the end zone. So with everything you include, make sure it's proving your point. Make every argument matter. And that's what Nephi is saying here. I'm going to show you my purpose is, that the, is to prove that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all, at least all whom he has chosen. Well, how do you get chosen? Well, because of their faith. Ah, you mean God chooses me as soon as I choose him? Yes, exactly. If we'll choose God, God chooses us. So because of our faith, he chooses to do what? To make us mighty through his grace, through his power, mighty enough to be delivered from our sins or our sorrows, from our myopic view of the world, from our misperceptions of him, like we saw last week with Laman and Lemuel. What kind of God is Nephi introducing us to? A God of tender mercies. They're over all. Just have faith. You'll be delivered. Look at dad. That's exactly what happened with Lehi. He was delivered from the, his persecutors in Jerusalem because he had faith in God. And that same, and because he chose God, God chose him, revealed to him his will. Take your family and flee. And he did. And look at all the grace he's been giving us ever since. One of the months where I did, when I did that Book of Mormon marathon, it was a tender mercy month. And from start to finish, I tried to find proof for Nephi's thesis. And it's everywhere. The God that the Book of Mormon presents to its readers is approachable. He is a merciful Messiah, a compassionate Christ, one that stands with arms outstretched, beckoning us to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be saved. Think back to Moroni's title page. Again, not, to, not only to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, but to show our fathers the great things that God has done for them. To help them see that they're not cast off forever. That God keeps his covenant, and it's a covenant of compassion. To me, it, no... When, ne when Moroni wrote the title page, he must have had Nephi's thesis statement in mind because it echoes it. In fact, when Moroni wrote his promise at the end of Moroni 10, he must have had Nephi's thesis statement in mind. Because how does he say it? Remember, it's not just search the Book of Mormon and pray about it. It's think about how merciful God has been. From the creation on down to the time that you have this book in your own hands. Yes, reader, I'm speaking to you. And ponder how merciful God has been. Because that's what this book has been trying to persuade you of. If Nephi says, I'm going to show you the tender mercies of God. And then Moroni says, is he that way? Did it work? Did the Book of Mormon do its job? Did it prove its point and persuade you to come unto Christ? In that light... The question you ask from Moroni's promise is not, is the book true, but rather, did the book work? And by the end of that experience, by the end of this year's experience in the text, oh, I pray that the Book of Mormon has worked for you, that it proved its point and served its purpose. Time will tell. And in the meantime, are we coming unto Christ based on the 
portrayal of the Savior that this magnificent scripture gives us. That's what it all boils down to. Okay. Now with chapter 6, you can actually skip ahead to chapter 9 because it's one other interesting interruption. Uh, there's no narrative flow there. It's another time where the, where the storyline stops in its tracks. But in chapter 9, and I'll just say this very, very briefly. We're going to water ski over this one. It's when God tells Nephi, good work making these plates. You need to make another, another copy. And you want two sets of plates. It's actually funny the way you read it because he's like, okay, I'm supposed to have two sets of plates. One's going to be big. One's going to be small. Uh, the big ones, I'm going to call the plates of Nephi. And these small ones, I guess I'll just call the plates of Nephi. Oh, wait, I already used that. Oh, darn it. Now nah, it's already engraved in gold. I can't go back and erase. Oh, well, uh, well I guess we'll, in, in subsequent history, they'll refer to them as the large plates and the small plates. Good enough. The large ones will be for the reigns of the kings, uh, the basic history that this one's not going to be. Remember what he said in chapter 6? But this one, these small plates of Nephi, will be for the ministry. That's the fullness of my intent. You could picture him then saying, then why write the big ones? Well, someone later is going to ask, why write the small ones? Just trust me on this. And that's what Nephi does. At the end of chapter 9, he, sa- he basically asks, why do I have to do this? It sure seems redundant to me. Well, I don't know. And he fully admits that. There's some humility on his part. I don't know what I'm doing here. Why I have to write two different copies. But God does. And that's how he ends things in chapter 9. The Lord hath commanded me to make these things for a wise purpose in him, which purpose I know not. But the Lord knoweth all things from the beginning. Wherefore, he prepareth a way to accomplish all his works among the children of men. Can you hear the echo of 1 Nephi 3, 7 there? He commands and he prepares a way to accomplish it. For behold, he hath all power unto the fulfilling of all his words. And thus it is. Amen. And that's enough for him. He learned that in the dark streets of Jerusalem a few chapters ago. That when God commands, just do it. And obedience is what he is asking of me. Thus it is. Amen. I'm going to do this. In a couple of weeks, we, or months, a couple of months actually, we will see when we study Words of Mormon why this is so important. And why a God who sees the end from the beginning can put some things in place at the beginning, that will save us all by the end. Now, if that is all, oh, director's cut kind of material, if what we see in chapter 6 and chapter 9 is more to explain what Nephi is doing as an author and editor, then let's get back to the story. And like I said, chapter 5 ends with Nephi, with Lehi reading scripture and accounts of Adam and Eve, and then chapter 7 begins with the realization, oh no, we need more Eves. So boys, will you please go back to Jerusalem and find, he's very specific, find Ishmael and his family and convince them to come with us on our journey. Now I want you to think for a moment, especially any of you who have proposed, okay, whether successfully or unsuccessfully, okay, I'm guilty of both as well, all with the same person. Uh, Some of you know that story. But Think about what kind of a proposal it would be. Uh, imagine Laman, Lemuel, Nephi, or Sam and Nephi all getting down on one knee in, in, in a row and, and proposing to the daughters of Ishmael. I know that's not how it was done back in, the, in that day. But imagine the kind of proposal they're making. Oh, w- will you marry? I, what was your name again? I, I know I don't know you. You don't know me. Uh, we'll make covenants like, like Nephi and Zoram did. It'll, it'll erase fear and give us courage. Okay, we learned that last week. But, uh, hey, perfect stranger, would you like to join me on a journey that never ends? Uh, you'll be giving up all of your earthly possessions just like we already did. Oh, yeah, sorry, Ishmael. We've got no, nothing to give you. We don't have the 10 camels of Abraham's servant. We don't even have the eight cows of Johnny Lingo. We got nothing for you, okay? <laughs> we got brass plates. Uh, We have uh, tents and camels, uh, but that's because we need them to journey through the wilderness, because that's all we got for you now. Uh, But I hold out hope. Dad said we'll have a promised land. And though the only land of promise a a Jew has ever, ever heard of, a Hebrew has ever had in mind, was Israel? Yeah, just trust us. God has something better in store. What do you say? Will you marry me? Now, I'm amazed that they would have the courage to even attempt. 
I thought I had, I, I thought I was making a rough offer. You want to marry me? Uh, <laughs> a life of obscurity and poverty awaits you, okay? Uh, but I'll do my best. And to me, when you look at chapter 7, I, I love the way it's described right from the start. Chapter 7, if you look at verse 1 at the end, it's when it dawns on Lehi, I can't take my family into the wilderness alone. My sons have to have daughters so they can raise up seed unto the Lord in the land of promise. In fact, there's an interesting phrase in there when he says, it was not meat for him to go alone. Well, if it's not meat, no wonder you need and help meat for you, which is exactly what Adam realized in the garden. Help, we need helps meet for one another, equal partners to move forward on our journey to the promised land. They will all need that. So he tells them to go back. And if you look at verse 4, how's this for you, your proposal? came to pass that we went up into the house of Ishmael, and we did gain favor in the sight of Ishmael. That's absolutely essential. That's why missionaries try to start by oh, establishing a relationship of trust trying to gain favor in the sight of the person. I mean, because a missionary invitation is a proposal of sorts as well. Will you study the gospel? Will you join the church? Will you be baptized and make a covenant to launch out into an unknown wilderness with hopes of a promised land awaiting? Okay? It's, again, I'm amazed that missionaries invite people to be baptized so quickly. It's like proposing on a first date. And essentially, that's exactly what Lehi's sons are doing here. So first they gained favor in Ishmael's sight, insomuch that we did speak unto him the words of the Lord. And that's a key aspect of this too. It's not, yeah, it's not some earthly proposal. It, this is no mere mortal marriage. This is a, a union of divine design. And it is not just me on my knee. This is God in heaven inviting you to come and join him as he leads us toward the promised land. When a missionary extends that kind of invitation, you'll be amazed at the responses of the Ishmaels of the world that find themselves agreeing to do the unthinkable, the impossible, the unimaginable, but there's something about you that I know you're speaking the word of God to me, and I'll follow his will wherever it leads. Thus, verse 5, it came to pass that the Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael. And that's absolutely essential as well. That's the only hope you've got. Well, in my case, the only hope I had was that God would soften the heart of my wife and she would say yes to me. Same here with Ishmael. God softened his heart and also his household insomuch that they took their journey with us down into the wilderness to the tent of our father. And I love the fact that he brought everybody with him. In some ways... Ishmael and his wife would have been unnecessary. In some ways, any oh, previously married uh, child of Ishmael, well, we don't need them either. I only need enough kids for my kids to marry. But no, that would be breaking up a family. And if the whole purpose of this part of the journey was to create families, then let's not destroy one in order to create others. Okay? So they all come. But the interesting thing about this, and this is where the plot really thickens in chapter 7, and, and to me it becomes one of the great lessons of what to do if someone in your wagon train, someone that's with you on the journey of life, if they decide they don't want to continue traveling. If this is a spiritual journey, what do you do when loved ones, when family members decide they don't want to keep going. When they don't think there's a promised land on the other side, that a softened heart becomes hardened again, and they think life is better back in Jerusalem, and so I might as well just go. And they threaten, or not just threaten, but act on it. They leave the church. They leave God. They break their covenants. They go on a different journey in a different direction. What do you do? To me, First Nephi chapter 7, right here at the beginning of the book, teaches us some incredible truths about that. So let's see some principles unfold. In verse 6 and 7, you see which ones are on Nephi's side and which ones opt to join Laman and Lemuel. Because you know it, it's Laman saying, well, I want to go back to the land of my inheritance. 
Well, maybe if, now that Laban's gone, we can get our stuff back. Okay, uh, I want, I'd rather I'd rather do that. And sure enough, there end up being two daughters of Ishmael that side with them. I mean, talk about a match made in heaven, right? Uh, Lemanina and Lemuelina. I, I don't know what their names would have been, but they seem to be tailor-made, cut from the same kind of cloth as Laban and Lemuel. There are two sons of Ishmael that want to go back home also. So again, they seem to be kindred spirits of Nephi's older brothers. Uh, those are the only two sons that Ishmael has, according to the record. He's got other daughters, and that's good, because Nephi is going to want to marry somebody more like him than, more like, than, than like Laman. But you now have a division, and some of you have experienced that in your own families, where some children are staying faithful and other children are, are walking away. And what do I do? Now, we, we can't see ne uh, Lehi and Sariah here. From based on chapter 5, you wonder how they would react if they were there present. But we do see Nephi's response, and it's a fascinating one. Now, for this first part, look at verse 8 and just listen to his words spoken to his older brothers as they're planning on, on apostatizing, okay, leaving all of this. He says, Behold, ye are mine elder brethren. How is it that ye are so hard in your heart, so blind in your minds, that you need that I, your younger brother, should speak unto you? Yea, set an example for you. Can you picture how angry, frustrated Nephi would be? He's just kind of spitting out those words. You hard-hearted, blind-minded punk, older brother that's acting like my little one. What, do I really have to coddle you? Show you the way? <laughs> Change your diaper and wipe your nose? Come on. You know better than this. Ooh, talk about a wonderful way to win friends and influence people. How would Laman and Lemuel respond to that? Just with greater anger. They will match your anger and then raise you some if that's how you respond. I think often people who are leaving the church are waiting to see the response of those they tell. And it will either justify their decision or make them second guess it. To me, the biggest tragedy is when somebody says they're going to leave the church and then we respond in such a way that they feel good about the decision. Like, yep, I'm leaving because Latter-day Saints are judgmental, and you just proved my point. Or they care about the gospel more than about me. And yep, as, as you slam the door and tell me where I'm going. Now, I want to salvage Nephi for a moment, because I purposely read it wrong just now. Now, I read the words correctly, but with the completely wrong tone of voice. Have you ever sent a text and known you have to include a certain emoji? Because without the emoji, the text itself could be read in all kinds of ways that you didn't intend. Well, that's what happens here. When it says that he said, you're my elder brother, and that you're heart in heart and blind in mind, that's the words, that's the language he used. But notice what it says at the beginning of verse 8. And now I, Nephi, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, Therefore, I spoke unto them. And that's when you read what I read before. So how would you read it now that you know it's not anger as the guiding emotion? Rather, it is sorrow. It is godly grief from a younger brother who grew up probably idolizing Laman. Biggest brother. Until he saw where his brother was leading and chose to be an alternate leader to give Sam, and even Lemuel if he wanted to, a second choice. Oh, behold, ye are mine elder brethren. How is it that ye are so hard in your hearts, so blind in your minds, that ye have needed I, your younger brother? Can you sense there? Nephi doesn't want to lead. He has no intent to usurp family authority. I, I'm just your younger brother. How is it that you would need that someone as lowly as me should speak unto you, yea, and set an example for you? Please read everything that goes forward in the tone of sorrow, informed by love, not anger, informed by frustration or wrath. What does Nephi do in this situation? What can you and I do if someone is struggling spiritually and threatening to leave the covenant path? Well, again, approach them in a sorrowful love, 
and then begin to remind them as best you can of spiritual experiences. That's what Nephi does in verse 10 and 11 and 12. They all begin with, how is it that ye have forgotten? In the first one, it's their own spiritual experience. You have seen an angel. Or more generally, the great things the Lord hath done for us. That's almost straight from the title page. He's delivered us from the hands of Laban. He's helped us obtain the record. He's done all of these things. From that personal to the more familial, now how's this for the universal? How could you forget that God is able to do all things? According to his will for the children of men. There's another echo of 1 Nephi 3.7. He can do all things if it so be that they exercise faith in him. There's an echo of his thesis statement, right? He is those whom he hath chosen because of their faith. He'll make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. He can do that. That's what makes him so tender and merciful in all that he does. Wherefore, here's his oh, take away from all of those memories. Let us be faithful to him. That's all I'm asking. And notice the plural pronoun there. Let us. I'm with you. I'm here. We can do this. Look at all that God has done for you and for us and for others. Please, can we be faithful together? Then in verse 13, notice this. If it so be that we are faithful to him. And there's the we again. It's as if he's including himself on their side. That's an if. If we'll be faithful. I understand where you're coming from, but if it so be that we are faithful to him, we shall obtain the land of promise. That's my testimony. And ye shall know at some future period that the word of the Lord shall be fulfilled concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. We don't know it for sure now, but we will someday. And just to try to offer them your best view of what the future holds, if we can simply stay faithful to the Lord, things will get better. God promises. He then says in verse 15, Behold, I say unto you that if ye will return unto Jerusalem, ye shall perish with them. That's why we left in the first place. That's what dad was prophesying about. And that's not just foolish imaginations from a visionary man. Those things are true. I prayed about them. God softened my heart. I'm with you. I was, I was tempted to murmur just like you have. But everything changed when the revelation came. So don't go back. You'll perish. But then notice what he says. This is a key passage for this whole chapter. And now, if ye have choice, and they do, he's honoring that. I know you can make your own decision. You're my big brothers. What, am I going to like bind and gag you and drag you back home to mom and dad? I, I can't. So if ye have choice, fine, go up to the land. And remember the words which I speak unto you, that if ye will go, ye will also perish, for thus the Spirit of the Lord constraineth me that I should speak. Now what amazes me here is the way Nephi approaches his brothers. The end there is one important clue. We have to say the things the Spirit, as guided by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, our anger is going to get in the way. Our frustration will fill our mouths with things we shouldn't say. Things will come across in a negative way instead of a way that honors the humanity, the spiritual experiences, the, the identity of the other person, elder brother, party to spiritual experiences, miraculous events. Oh, I know who you really are, big brother. Someone who could set an incredible example. I just want to follow you into the wilderness and keep following you toward the promised land once our mother and father pass on. This could have been the book of Laman from the start instead of the book of Nephi. And I think Nephi would have been fine with it. Say whatever the Spirit constrains you to. But notice the three elements of what Nephi has said in that last verse. Because they perfectly parallel what I call the Samuel principle from the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, it's the story where the Israelites want to have a king so they can be like all the other nations. And that's wrong. And Samuel knows it. He's ready to say, over my dead body, 
But God reins him in and says, okay, okay, let's, <clears throat> let's think this through. Are you really going to be able to stop them? you got the whole house of Israel basically rebelling. And please understand, it's between them and me, not between them and you. They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. If anyone should be angry about this, it's me. And isn't that true about your prodigal child? Your, your wandering friend? It's between them and God, not them and you. Keep that in mind. It will allow you to approach things from a healthier emotional place. So what does God tell Samuel to do? Three things. He says, hearken unto their voice, which must have been so hard for Samuel to hear. Like, what? We're just going to give in? We're going to roll over and let them do what's wrong? And, so, and God's like, well, yeah, that's what agency is. We teach them correct principles and let them govern themselves. And even when they're govern governing themselves in the wrong way, especially when it's the house of Israel, especially when it's an adult child like Laman would have been, Again, what are you going to do? Hogtie them? No, at the end of the day, they will do what they're going to do. And there's nothing you can do about that. So, again, better not intensify their emotions by some kind of over-my-dead-body reaction. No, we're going to hearken to their voice. But that's not all. The key part of this is to hold that on one side of the balance, but put something else on the other side. Yes, there's a contrary we have to prove here. And for any of you parents or friends or family members of those who are struggling, you've got to master the Samuel principle. So let's finish the verse. Therefore, hearken unto their voice. That's the first part. Honor their agency. How be it yet? And this is where he's like, whoa, 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 but before you overcorrect, before you just say, fine, what, who am I to get in your way and, and just go on back and I'm not going to say anything about it. No, that's an abdication of our parental responsibilities. That is a surrender of our love. Because my, my, the love I have for them uh, is what makes it, makes it so hard to say yes and honor their agency. I can't take that to the extreme where I stop their agency, but I can't take it to the opposite extreme where their agency forces me to abdicate my own. So what part does my agency play? Here's the other half of it, okay? Hearken unto their voice, how be it yet, number one, protest solemnly unto them. Not angrily, but solemnly. With the power of the Holy Ghost, let them know how you feel, which would take you in a different direction from the one they're headed toward. That, why do you think Nephi is saying, I, I, I wish you wouldn't go. I wish you'd stay. That's my will. I see yours. And at the end of the day, I'm going to honor it. But I have to speak up for my will too. And then the third thing, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Try to help them see what the future of their decision holds. And that's exactly what Nephi does here too. It's amazing. In Samuel's day, he lets them do what they want. And yes, they end up going that way, unfortunately. That's the first, hearken to their voice. But second, protest. And he does. He lets them know how he feels. And third, show them the manner. And he does. He prophesies the kinds of kings they'll end up having. And sure enough, all that happens. Nephi has done exactly the same. If ye have choice, there's honoring agency. Go up. But please know that that is not God's will. He, now he's protesting solemnly. Or when he says, let us be faithful to him. That's the leg that, Le that Nephi is standing on. And then finally, show them the manner. Well, if it so be, ye shall perish with the others in Jerusalem. Nephi does it textbook with all of this. Now, sadly, Laman and Lemuel do not respond the way Nephi hoped just like the people didn't respond well to Samuel. But at least there is hope for maintaining some kind of relationship. Okay? I haven't burned the bridge that they are crossing. There's still a chance for them to cross back. This is just like the, parent, the father of the prodigal son. You're treating me as if I were dead? Well, then I will swallow hard and allow it to happen. And in love, I will offer you the inheritance that you're demanding early. I need to do that so that when you do come to yourself off in that far country, your first thoughts of home will be positive. 
you'll know you can come back to a father who loves you, who honors your agency, who sees you for who you are. Okay? In this moment, in Nephi's story, they tie him up and they're plotting his death. This becomes Joseph in Egypt all over again. We've seen some Exodus parallels. He's like, wait, we're just like Moses. And they're like, yeah, you're just like Joseph. And let's tie you up and leave you to die, torn apart by the animals. Well, they're acting like the animals themselves. And what does Nephi do? He doesn't fight back. He simply prays. You can see it in verse 17. O Lord, according to my faith, which is in thee, wilt thou deliver me from the hands of my brethren? Yea, even give me strength that I may burst these bands with which I am bound. Can you hear the thesis statement guiding his words there? It's according to my faith. That's what allows me to be chosen by God. And because of his tender mercies, he will make those whom he hath chosen mighty even unto the power of deliverance. Oh, if, if Lehi and the people of Jerusalem were exhibit A to prove Nephi's point, if Nephi and Laban were exhibit B, well, here's exhibit C. Please, God, deliver me. Make me mighty enough to be delivered. And an important point there is the fact that he's praying for himself. He's, he's not saying, God, please strike down my brothers. Please change their mind. I honor their agency. I just don't want you to. No, he's praying can I, can, will, please let something happen to me. In our case, maybe it's, I feel bound by cords of frustration. I'm, I'm angry that the, I, I, gave, I poured my life into that child. And now they're throwing it all back in my face. Father, because of my faith in thee, wilt thou please deliver me from these bands? Wilt thou please give me the spiritual strength, the godly grace, the Christian compassion to look at my child and love them. So I'll be strong enough to break out of these, these shackles I've forged for myself. Please help me. And what's interesting in the story is the miracle comes, though not quite as dramatically as Nephi envisioned. His thought was, give me strength, let me burst the bands. Then they'll really, maybe there's in the back of his mind, then they'll see that I'm worth following. And instead, the way the miracle is performed is so simple. It's more still small voice than earthquake, wind, and fire, to borrow Elijah's experience. Instead of being strong enough to burst the bands, the bands just loosen and fall off his hands and feet. I guess Laman and Lemuel ditched Boy Scouts, before they learned all the good not tying merit badges. Uh, no, this was divine deliverance, but in a subtle, humble way. And I think in a similar way, as we come into Christ ourselves, again, if they're leaving the Savior, the worst thing we can do is leave the Savior in our response to their departure. Instead, no, come unto Him. It'll give those prodigals, uh, the, the right place to come home to. But pray for deliverance and just let the frustration, the angst, the anger, the worry, the anxiety, just let it fall off your troubled heart. It's a simple miracle, but it's life-changing when it comes. What happens next? Well, even then, they're still mad. It's like, I'm doing everything the way I'm supposed to, following the Samuel principle, just praying for my own deliverance. Uh, it's nothing's working. But here's the amazing part at the end of chapter 7. Finally, when all is said and done, and Laman and Lemuel are up in arms again, ready to kill their little brother, a few people come to Nephi's rescue. And if you look at the list in verse 19, one figure ought to surprise us. It says one of the daughters of Ishmael, but we can't tell if this was one of the two that had rebelled originally or one of the others who had not. So that might be somebody who was on Nephi's side all along. So skip that one. Yea, also her mother, 
But uh, Mrs. Ishmael had been on Nephi's side from the start, and so there's no change there. But then the next one, and one of the sons of Ishmael. We knew there were only two from the start of this chapter, and both of them sided with Laman and Lemuel. So one of them had a change of heart. I'm guessing it was the Ishmaelite equivalent of Lemuel, a follower by nature, but decided to switch the person he let lead. It's like, you know, the more I hear Nephi, he's he's a good kid. I mean, he's going to let us do what we want, but I wonder if he's right about that whole destruction of Jerusalem thing. I'm starting to remember my spiritual experience when God softened my heart enough to go on this crazy journey in hopes of finding some promised land I've never seen. It's that young man who changed his mind, changed his heart, and then he changed the hearts of Laman and Lemuel. Together with the others that had always been on, Laman, on, on Nephi's side, they did plead with my brethren in so much that they did soften their hearts and they did cease striving to take away my life. And I think that's a beautiful oh, miracle to hope for. I might not change the heart of the of my target audience. But if I can change the heart of someone who's overhearing us, some third party that seems to be siding with the prodigal, but now their heart is changed to side with the Lord. But because they have a better relationship, a closer connection to the person I'm so worried about, maybe maybe the Lord's working indirectly on them instead of directly. And I'll just trust in that. Years ago, I read a Facebook post of a former student of mine who was so mad at the church. He'd left it, uh, and he was just spitting venom back in the direction of every member. And so, because I love him, he's one of my old students. I tell my students to this day, once a student, always a friend. And I typed in on the, in the comment section of his Facebook post how much I loved him. And I honored life's journey for him wherever the twists and turns. And I just wanted him to know I'm here for you. And if you ever want to talk and ask questions or vent or whatever you want, I'm here for you. Your old friend, Brother Halverson. He responded back in the exact opposite spirit than what I expected. I I fully expected him to go, oh, bro, how? Okay, you... Yeah, okay, okay, not every Latter-day Saint's a jerk, you know, or whatever. And we had some good times back in, in the seminary days, and we did. I saw him post-seminary, post-mission. We reconnected. Amazing guy. And then something happened, and it all fell apart. And he was so mad, including at me. Because when, when I made the comment, he responded back. With all of Facebook looking on, you... You were part of the problem. You were my seminary teacher and convinced me to make those horrible, stupid self-sacrifices. I wasted two years of my life on a mission. Think about all the tithing money I blew. And, and it was partly your fault. And I was like, wow, okay. Mm. Now is it my turn to match his venom with some of my own? Or simply to metabolize it and return anger with love? Thankfully, I opted for that and simply said to him, again, I am so sorry for whatever twists and turns your life has taken. I do love you as a brother. And this decision on your part doesn't change any of that. But I will stand behind everything I taught you so long ago. It, it's true. And if I could go back, maybe I'd try to be more sensitive I was young too, but, but I believe with all my heart. And again, if you want to talk and ask and vent and anything, I'm here for you. He was still angry. Our conversation didn't end well. But like a week later, I was fascinated to receive an email from a third party. The one of the sons of Ishmael, I suppose. It was actually another former student of mine who knew that other former student. That's why we were all still Facebook friends. And she said, as I watched him explode and vent, and then when I saw your comment and then saw his response, and I just kind of cringed for everyone, I'm like, oh boy. But then I saw your response to that. 
It's like they were just, I mean, that's the amazing thing about reading comment sections. You get to eavesdrop on other people's conversations, right? But as she was eavesdropping on ours, she said, my sister, who you also know, who has left the church a long time ago, she watched that. She read it. And we ended up having one of the best spiritual conversations we've had in years. Because she noticed the way you responded. That it was in love. Instead of in anger or even in self-defense. Again, the best thing we can do when they leave is treat them in such a way that they second-guess their decision. They're not as mean as I thought. They're not being judgmental. Why not? That would help me feel justified in my departure. Now this... The, the, the son of Ishmael is just eavesdropping. But it changes his heart. And as a result, he is later able to change the heart of Laman and Lemuel. In this story, it plays out in a couple of columns. In the life of those you love, it might take a long, long time. But be patient. Follow the Samuel principle. Be loving, no matter what. With that, this chapter ends. And... Laman and Lemuel actually repent. Shocking, right? They ask Nephi for his forgiveness. And I love the way he says it. I did frankly forgive them. And I don't even think he puts a period there because he, he, he can't end the, the sentence on his own forgiveness because who cares about that? It's like, it, it, it's not me you've offended. It's God. So yeah, I forgive you. No problem. Okay. I just, I want, I, I want God to forgive you too. And I know he will. Tender mercies are over all that, have chose, that he's chosen. Just please choose him. Please repent and seek his forgiveness. And they do, and he forgives them as well. And the way chapter 7 ends, this is something Elder Bednar pointed out once that I loved, that chapter 7 ends with as about, about as unified a family as you'll probably ever see in this first family of the Book of Mormon. They're all on the same page. I mean, wedding bells are about to, to ring when you get back and start meeting the families and integrating, right? You have Laman and Lemuel repenting and not just seeking forgiveness of their brother, but of their father in heaven. And we're all on the same page now, and this is a great moment. And the way Elder Bednar pointed it out was, it's in this moment that a glorious revelation comes. Lehi's dream. And is there something about two or three being gathered in his name where he will manifest himself in the midst? That when we come together in unity, the windows of heaven will open and we will receive the revelation that we need. Think about that the next time you're in ward council or a presidency meeting or in family council or talking to someone you love. Okay, unity is absolutely key. And with that, we can turn the page and see chapter 8, which so many of you are already experts in.